Hello friends, let's do the poem My Last Duchess written by Robert Browning. This is a very popular poem and it is a classic example of the genre of poetry called the dramatic monologue. In one of my earlier videos, I have discussed in great detail what uh, the features of the dramatic monologue are. So here, generally in a dramatic monologue, we have um, um, a speaker and we also have a silent listener and uh, it is usually a very dramatic moment in um, the speaker's life and he tells us a lot of things which reveal to us information about the speaker himself and maybe a little detail about the listener too. This poem, My Last Duchess, was published for the first time in 1842 and let me go straight to the poem. I am not going to read the whole poem at a stretch. Let's do it little by little. So here, uh, the setting of the poem is uh, the, the palace of the Duke of Ferrara and the Duke of Ferrara is said to be Alfonso II of the city of Ferrara in Italy and he is talking so the speaker of this poem is the Duke of Ferrara or Alfonso II though the name of the person is not mentioned anywhere and he is talking to the ambassador of another uh, place who has come there with an alliance, a marriage alliance because his wife, the, the duke's wife uh, had died and he was um, seeking a wife and so he is talking to uh, the ambassador who has come from another place. So he is, uh, the duke takes him around to show him the palace and he takes him to a kind of a gallery where a lot of paintings by famous artists are displayed and he points to one particular picture and starts talking about the picture. That is how the poem begins. So let me read the first few lines. My last duchess. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you, that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as if as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, it was not her husband's presence only, called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling upon that spot of joy. Okay, so uh, he, it, uh, he shows this painting and tells him, that is the picture of my last duchess. So she is now no more and you can take a look at the picture. This was my wife and look at the picture. She looks as if she, it looks as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder, that's a wonderful piece of painting because it makes you feel that she can step out of the painting any moment alive. And then she says, Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. So the pain, the artist, the artist's name was Fra Pandolf. Fra is a priest, okay, brother, a priest. And it is he he spent one whole day to draw this picture and there she stands and then he invites uh, the duke invites his guest and tells him why don't you sit down there is a chair right there in front of the painting why don't you sit down there and take a look a detailed look at the painting and, and he bids the man to sit down 
and he says um, I said Fra Pandolf by design for never read strangers like you that pictured counted it. So he says that uh, I can understand because when he looks at uh, the picture and when he says that Fra Pandolf that is a priest had painted it uh, always strangers uh, they uh, turn to look at the um, at the duke uh, with a question in their on their face because they want to ask him they don't dare to ask him but they want to ask him how is it that such a glance came there that is what the, the, the duchess in the picture looks uh, kind of she is uh, blushing and so what exactly must have made her blush like that that is the question that comes to the mind of people who look at uh, this painting and they are quite surprised to know that it was a priest who painted it because generally uh, a priest uh, or a, a, a woman does not express such kind of uh, feelings uh, blushing and such things uh, to a priest because a priest is a, a religious person he is not at all a worldly person and so he says that uh, maybe you too want to ask me that question uh, but to myself they turned the depth and passion of its earnest glance so the glance in in on the face of that lady but to myself they turned they were directed definitely towards me and then uh, all all the people who come there they also turn to look at me when they see this picture because i am the only person who has the right to draw this curtain nobody else touches this curtain or nobody else looks at this picture without my permission i alone do that so there again you can see the authority of this person and they asks me ask me if they durst that is if they have the courage to ask me they just like you have now turned and looked at my face though you haven't asked me i can see the question in your uh, eyes and so they have asked um, so you are not the first one who has this doubt uh, and so he explains it was not just her husband's presence that called that spot of joy that is the flush or the blush on her cheek it's not just because i was present there but maybe the painter said something like uh, something uh, maybe he made a statement like her mantle laps over my lady's rest too much mantle is this a shawl like thing that they wear and so maybe he said uh, you should move it a little because it wraps too much on your wrist so please move it a little aside or maybe uh, he made a remark saying that paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat she must he must have said that there is no paint that can uh, reproduce the color of your, your the, the of the blush and of the color on your throat maybe he said something like that such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy and such stuff even a simple statement like this would make her smile and would make her blush and then he says um, she had her heart how shall i say too soon made glad too easily impressed she liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere so now you start getting a better picture about this lady and about this man who's talking about her so he says uh, now how do i put it now she used to be pleased too soon simple things could make her happy uh, she was she had a heart that was uh, how do i say that too soon made glad so a, a, a very a simple um, word of praise like what fra pandolf said uh, any little thing would make her happy and she would immediately blush she liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere so that is a kind of a complaint you can sense it there she liked whatever she looked on and and she used to look everywhere sir it was all one my favor at her breast the dropping of the daylight in the west the bow of cherry some officious fool broke in the orchard for her the white mule she rode with round the terrace all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least so she says for her everything was same whether 
it is my love for her or that is what he says first my favor at her breast means my love for her which she definitely knew about or when she sees the dropping of the daylight the sunset in the west sometimes when she walked in the orchard some officious fool means maybe a the gardener or somebody would break a, a branch of cherries a bough of cherries and offer it to her that would make her happy and sometimes she would ride on the white mule a beautiful white mule that one would make her happy so everything was kind of equal to her so what we should understand here is that he doesn't like the fact that she appreciates his love and just like she appreciates anything else she did not give more value to his affection for her so that's why he puts them all first he said about his love for her and then the sunset uh, uh, the berries in the orchard a white mule that she rode everything would make her it it all would make her happy and she would either say some approving speech or she would blush she thanked men good but thanked somehow i know not how as if she ranked my gift of 900 years old name with anybody's gift so she would thank people for the simple you know things they did for her and he says see i i don't mind that it's okay it's good to thank people but then she thanked men so profusely with the same enthusiasm as if my gift of one of 900 years old name was anybody's gift because when he married her and she became the duchess of ferrara she was uh, you know she became a claimant to a family name that was 900 years old so that was a great honor for her as far as he was concerned but then she showed the same gratitude to the others just as she showed to him so how could she do that shouldn't she be more grateful to me shouldn't she give less value to others but that was not how she did she was equally gracious to everybody equally grateful to everybody and he did not like that at all who stooped to blame this stop this sort of trif- trifling even had you skill in speech which i have not to make your will quite clear to such as one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she let herself be less and so no plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and made excuse even then would be some stupid who would stoop to blame this tra- sort of trifling even had you skill in speech which i have not to make your will quite clear to such an one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she let herself be less and so no plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and made excuse even then would be some stooping and i choose never to stoop so he says that he simply couldn't uh, kind of digest the idea that she considered all people equal when he gave her a gift now again earlier my favor at her breast can also mean maybe a, a valuable brooch with uh, the family crest or something uh, that which is very valuable as i told you the family was uh, his family has a history of 900 years and the name of alfonso's uh, family was este the este family they were one of the ancient one of the most ancient families of uh, uh, italy and so she showed no special gratitude to him for the very valuable antique gifts that he gave her she behaved graciously to everybody and so he did not like it but then he felt that it was below himself to call her and to admonish her or to tell her see i don't like what you're doing and he says even if you even had you skill in speech which i have not so it's very evident that he's got a lot of skill in speech but that he says see i don't know to speak uh, in a skillful manner 
பட் ஈவன் இஃப் ஐ நியூ ஐ உடன் ஸ்பீக் டு ஹர் அபவுட் இட் பிகாஸ் இட் இஸ் நாட் நைஸ் ஃபார் அ பர்சன் இட் இஸ் டிமீனிங் ஃபார் அ பர்சன் ஆஃப் மை ஸ்டாண்டிங் டு கால் அ பர்சன் அண்ட் சே சி ஐ டோன்ட் லைக் வாட் யூ டூ எஸ்பெஷலி மை வைஃப் ஹவு டு ஐ டெல் ஹர் வாட் யூ டூயிங் திஸ் கஸ்ட் மீ ஐ டோன்ட் லைக் திஸ் அண்ட் இஃப் அட் ஆல் ஐ செட் தேட் ஷி வுட் Uh, allow herself be, to be lessened so lessened so in the sense she would apologize and say i'm sorry i will not do it again i will not smile at anybody anymore or maybe she might plainly set her wit to yours and made excuse or she might uh, go against him and say that there is nothing wrong in what i'm doing i will continue to do so so one of these possibilities are there she would either agree and uh, to what i said and change or she would say no i will not i will continue to be as i am but then uh, i did not find it right i found it too insulting for me to go and tell her that you shouldn't behave like this and so i did not talk about it to her i chose never to stoop so you can see that he is a man with a lot of pride who considers himself uh, too high who cannot even tell his wife give her suggestion that he doesn't like what she is doing so a highly egoistic person and then he says i chose i choose never to stoop i'll never stoop in front of anybody so her behavior was often embarrassing for me the way she smiled at the gardener the way she smiled at the horseman i did not like it at all i found it very very insulting humiliating but no i wouldn't tell her about it oh sir she smiled no doubt whenever she i passed her but who passed without much the same smile so he says she used to smile at me whenever i passed her but then she used to smile at anybody who passed her that is the problem with him okay so he's extremely possessive he's happy when she smiles at him but he cannot stand it when she smiles at others so that's why he says oh sir she smiled no doubt whenever i passed her but who passed without much the same smile this grew that is her smiling continued i gave commands then all smiles stopped together so what does that mean he says and finally i grew tired of her smiles i gave some orders and all smiles stopped together that can mean that he ordered that she be put to death so that she will not smile at anybody else or maybe he has put her somewhere in prison so that nobody else can see the smile but chances are more that she has he has got her killed so now there she stands as if alive as if alive that means she is not alive and uh, here this man is sitting there uh the other man uh, the listener the silent listener sitting there and listening to this and then uh, he tells him and he's kind of frozen to his seat and uh, he now tells him the duke tells him will it please you rise we'll meet the company below then so i have shown you all this uh, uh, important things here i've shown you the picture of my duchess so now let's go downstairs and join the company below i repeat the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed and now he goes on to say of course i know that your master the count so now we know that the listener here is actually the ambassador of the count of tirol in austria he has come with a proposal uh, um, for the daughter of the count of tirol and so uh the duke is telling him so let's go and join now that you've seen everything that is there to be seen let's go down and join the others i repeat the count your master's known munificence munificence is generosity so he says i know that your uh, count is a very generous person and i know that he will give me a lot of dowry whatever i ask him for i know he'll give it to me um the cow um, i repeat the count your master's known munificence he's no, known munificence in the sense the count of tirol is already famous for his generosity that is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed so that i am sure that whatever i ask him 
as dowry, he will definitely give it to me. Though his fair daughter self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. So he says, but let me also tell you that my main object or my intention is to get his daughter, his fair daughter, uh, or uh, what he wants to say is that it is not the wealth that I am seeking, but then of course I understand that the wealth will come along with the daughter as as uh, dowry. And here again you can see that he is a quite uh, uh, a man who is hungry for wealth and he has uh, no qualms in talking about his desire for money and wealth. And so he says, of course, she, uh, the daughter is my main object. Nay, we will go together down, sir. Notice Neptune though, taming a seahorse, though thought a rarity, which claws of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. And he says, okay, let's go downstairs, but let me point out this painting to you. And it is um, um, Neptune. Neptune uh, in Roman mythology is the god of the sea. And so you can see the picture of Neptune taming a seahorse and this is supposed to be a rarity, a rare piece of art and this has been cast in bronze. I guess it's a statue, not exactly a painting and it is claws of Innsbruck. Innsbruck is a, is a place near Tyrol in Austria and this man comes from Tyrol in Austria and so uh, the, the duke tells him that this particular painting was made by an artist in your place and it was especially commissioned by me and made for me. And uh, that is the poem has an abrupt ending. So when we look at this poem, what do we see? And as I told you at the beginning, uh, this is a dramatic monologue and the poem Though the Duke doesn't really talk much about it himself, we understand he talks more about the painting and his wife, but from what he says about his wife, we understand a lot about him, about how he's very uh, dominating, you know, how he's extremely possessive, and how uh, he is a kind of uh, a maniac who cannot stand his wife even smiling at another person and a man who uh, had no difficulty in ordering the killing of his wife because she smiled at everybody and she thanked everybody for what they for the little favors that they did and uh, it is strange that he reveals this aspect of his character to a man who has come with a marriage proposal because if the ambassador is a man with any sense, he would definitely go back and give a very bad report about the Duke. Because it is very, very obvious that the Duke does not value uh, the woman or his wife as a person. And he just considers her to be a possession, a valuable object. And that is exactly how he sees the next person to, the wife to be. Because he says, I, am, I hope you will give me a good dowry. I know that, of course, my prime objective is to get your, uh, the daughter of your country. But uh, I am sure a lot of dowry will also come along with her. So you can see how in his mind, uh, the woman is just an object. Uh, one who is not supposed to display feelings of her own and uh, if, if he uh, one who can easily be uh, removed from his life if she does something to uh, go against his will or if she displeases uh, him and so you find a very jealous husband here in this particular character and so uh, we can see the themes that you see here mainly, one is this objectification of woman and uh, another thing is that um, his, his, fa his father-in-law, that is um, his wife was Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Elizabeth's father too was intensely possessive. He guarded his uh, children like uh, one would guard treasure and he wouldn't permit his daughter to get married. So maybe that also uh, uh, prompted 
this uh, the poet Robert Browning to uh, to uh, create such a character as the Duke. So it is a poem that very skillfully uh, uh, displays all the characteristic features of a dramatic monologue. Uh, and you you see the woman, though she is there just as a painting, you understand a lot about her character, you understand uh, much about the character of the Duke. And so uh, the poet uses the technique of the dramatic monologue very skillfully uh, in order to delineate the characters of these two persons. So it is undoubtedly one of his most popular dramatic monologues and it will continue to entertain readers in years to come.